Hi there. So now I'm going to talk to you guys about section 1.2. 1.2 is titled Rates of Change. And what I'll do to introduce this section is uh, go through one quick example and then we'll kind of get down to the meat of the matter. So this is somewhat dated data, but suppose in 1950, the world's population was 2.555 billion people. And in 1990, the world's population was 5.295 billion people. The first question I'm going to ask is what is the change in population over this 40-year period? Well, how would we compute the change in population over this 40-year period? Change means, well, we would take the population in 1990, subtract off the population in 1950, and we would get 2.74 billion people. So, what we can say is that over this 40-year period, the change was 2.74 billion people. In fact, it increased by 2.74 billion. Okay? What if now I ask this question? What is the average annual rate at which the population increased? over this time period. I'm actually asking a different question. Here, I wanted to know the change in population. Okay? Well, we were just taking billions of people minus billions of people and we could get the change. Here, I'm asking, what is the average annual rate at which the population changed? Annual meaning yearly rate. Well, how would we determine that? What we would do is we would take the change in population. Let me write that over here. So the change in population over the change in time. When we're talking about the rate, we're going to get a ratio. Think about it this way. When you talk about the rate at which you drive, you talk about miles per hour. There's a ratio. When you talk about fuel consumption, it's miles per gallon. Again, it's a ratio. This is population over time. Well, we know what the change in population was. We computed that already. We divide by 40 because that's the change in time. And in case you guys care, it's 0 0.0685 billion people per year. In other words, if you want to see it written out, that many people per year and a really interesting way to look at it is this is an increase of about 130 people per minute over that 40 year period. I know I kind of went over the top and did a lot of computations, but anyway, I think that's kind of an interesting way to look at it. So what I'm wanting to indicate to you guys is that there is a difference between the total change versus the average rate of change, okay? I will formally tell you
the following. The average rate of change of, let's just say, Q with respect to T over some interval is, we write that the change in Q over the change in T. Okay? This means change in, i.e. subtract. Essentially, this tells us how much Q changes on average for each unit of change of T. Now, I claim that you have played around with this idea before. We're actually kind of building to get somewhere. Okay? So, let's look at a table and kind of check it out in that context. Let us pretend that this is the number of students enrolled in college algebra. And we'll just say we've got year and then the number of students. And how about this? Let's start out in the 90s, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and how about 2004? Here, let me write number of students. You'll see that I really enjoy abbreviating things. So, let's just fill in this table. I suppose it's a rather large table for our purposes, but that's okay. Five seventy one and six thirty two. So, what this is saying is in the year two thousand and one, there were four hundred and thirty five students enrolled in college algebra, whereas in two thousand four, there were six hundred and thirty two students in college algebra. Okay? Now, really, I made a much bigger table than we need because all I'm going to ask us to do is the following. Let us find the average rate of change in the number of students enrolled and let's just do it between the years 2000 and 2004. Okay, so what we're going to do is actually compute this and then we'll interpret it. Well, again, we're wanting to find a rate, so we know that we're going to look at a ratio, okay? What we're going to look at is the change in the number of students over the change in time. So, how many students did we have in 2004? We had 632 students. How many students did we have in the year 2000? We have 388 students. And then we want to divide by the change in time. Yes, you could put 2004 minus 2000, or you could simply say, oh, that's equal to 4. So, let's compute this. We have 632 minus 388. So we're going to have 244, and then we're going to divide that by 4. So we get the number 61. But it's not the number that's really crucial. We need to be able to interpret what this means. Okay? Units are crucial. 
So, what does this mean in the context of this problem? Well, let's first talk about uh, the units. This numerator unit is number of students, and down here is year. So what I claim is the following. On average, between the year 2000 and 2004, the number of students increased by 61 per year. How do I know it increased? Because I got a positive number, okay? The number of students went up, okay? So, it increased by 61 students per year. Now, I want to liken this to function notation. And then I'm going to link it to something that you've all been um, introduced to before. Okay, let's back up to the last section very quickly. Okay, back to the independent variable and dependent variables. I claim the year is my independent variable and the number of students is my dependent variable. Okay, because the number of students enrolled depends upon the year. Okay, so instead of looking at it as independent and dependent variables, since this is the independent variables, those are generally what we call our x values, and these guys are generally what we call our y values. So, what does that mean? Notice, weren't we looking in, at the change in our y values? over the change in our x values, I claim that's something that you have learned before, okay? We'll see it in our next section, but this pertains to what we call our slope, okay? So, let us say this. If I have a graph, and let's pretend this is our function, f of x. And let's call this point A and this point B. Well, let's write these guys as ordered pairs. I claim this is A, f of A. And this is B, f of B. Okay? So, given this... If I want to know the average rate of change between these two points here, well, how did we determine it over there? Wasn't it the change in our y values or our function values over the change in our x values? So, what we could say is the average rate of change of our function from a to b is the change in our function values over the change in our x values, okay? This is exactly how we look at it when we compute our slope. Here we are. So when we're talking about the average rate of change, we are just thinking about our slope. Alrighty, so, this is going to be a moot point example soon enough, but what if I give you this function and I want us to find the average rate of change between x equals negative 2 and x equals 1. Now, those of you guys who have taken an algebra class recently, you're going to be able to look at this already and know the answer. But, you know what? Let us pretend we don't remember. So, using this formula, 
how would we find the average rate of change? Well, I think you will agree that I need to know what my function values are, okay? In other words, what is f of negative two and what is f of one, okay? I'm doing this again to reinforce what we spoke of in the last section. What does it mean to compute f of negative two? Everywhere where I see an x in my function f, I'm gonna plug in negative two. So I have five times negative two plus seven. Well, I claim I get negative three. If I wanna write that as an ordered pair, I can write that as negative two, negative three. Okay? Next, let us compute f of one. Well, that's five times one plus seven, and so we get 12. All right, how do we compute our average rate of change between these guys? Again, it's the change in our function values over the change in our x values. So we could say it's 12 minus a negative three, this guy minus this guy, divided by one minus a negative two. Well, remember minus a negative is the same as plus a positive. We get 15 over three, which is five. Okay, now a reasonable question to ask is, hey, why'd you start with the 12? Couldn't you have started with this value? And I claim absolutely we can. The thing is we have to keep consistent. So if someone else wanted to start with this function value, negative three, and then do minus 12, that's totally fine, but be sure if you start with this y value in the numerator, you start with his corresponding x value in the denominator. But you'll see you get the same thing. You get negative 15 over negative three, and you still get five. Sweet. Now, I gotta point one thing out. Those of you guys who remember your algebra from recently, well, you'll be able to link that up. But remember how we computed slope before in a class? This is the graph of a line. And remember the number in front of x is precisely our slope or our average rate of change. So the cool thing about lines, I mean there's a lot of cool things about lines, but one of the cool things about lines is that they have a constant rate of change and you can always look exactly what it is. All right, next, let us play with a couple more examples. Now what I'm going to do is attempt to draw a graph and then we're going to compute some average rates of change here. Okay. Isn't necessarily pretty, but I'll do the best I can. Woo. Okay, let's get this looking a little better. There we go. Okay. Pretend that's a straight line. That's the point 2.2, point two. this is four. Here we're at 5.2, here we're at 6.9, and then I'll say this is eight. Let me and pretend that's a straight line. <laughs> okay, and let's say that this is 2.9, and this way up here is 4.9. 
In other words, at 2.2, we're up at 2.9. At 4, we're at 0. At 5.2, we're also at 2.9. Same with at 6.9, we're at 2.9. And at 8, we're back down at 0. Okay? Let's say that this dashed line is our function g, and this nice curve is our function f. Okay? First thing we want to do, let's find the average rate of change of f for x between 2.2 and 6.1. I suppose it would help if I labeled 6.1 on my graph. There we are. Okay, well, what I want to know is what's the average rate of change of my function f between 2.2 and 6.1. Again, the average rate of change is the change in my function values over the change in my x values. My x values I'm given, 6.1 and 2.2. So above them, I'll put my function values, okay? At 6.1, what's my function value? It's 4.9. Good thing it's an erase board. <laughs> and at 2.2, my function value is 2.9. So 4.9 minus 2.9 is 2, and 6.1 minus 2.2 is 3.9. And if I divide this, I get about 0.51. All right, let's do this question. Let's give an interval where the average rate of change of f is zero. Cool. Well, how would we do this? What we're saying is we want our fraction to be equal to zero. Well, recall, a fraction is equal to zero precisely where your numerator is zero, okay? In other words, I want my function values to be the same. Well, what intervals do we have? I claim I can look at three intervals right now. We can say, well, one interval is when x is between 2.2 to 5.2 because they both have the same function value. Another one is how about from 5.2 to 6.9. Another one, so we don't have to deal with decimals, is how about from 4 to 8? They have the same function value. We have quite a few choices here, okay? But again, your average rate of change is gonna be zero precisely where your numerator is zero. All right. Um, let me ask you this. Is the average rate of change from 2.2, from x equals 2.2 to x equals 4. So from 2.2 to 4, for my function f, is the average rate of change positive or negative? Well, we could actually go and compute this exactly, 
right? Because we would take our function value at 4 minus our function value at 2.2. Well, my function value at 4 is 0. My function value at 2.2 is 2.9. Well, we don't even have to take this further because we see we get a negative number in our numerator and a positive number in our denominator. And a negative divided by a positive is negative. So from 2.2 to 4, for my function f, we have a negative average rate of change. Okay? Now, what if I asked you, with those exact same numbers, from 2.2 to 4, but now let's look at our function g. g is our dashed line here. Well, again, we could put in our denominator 4 minus 2.2. And let us figure out what our numerator is. Well, what's the function value of g at 4? Um, let's just pretend this is at 4, OK? Doesn't really matter. You want to, you know it's greater than 2.9, which is actually the key. And my function value at 2.2 is 2.9. Here, again, we don't need to do any computations. We might as well be lazy while we have the opportunity. The point is, it's a positive over a positive, which is positive. So here, our average rate of change is actually increasing. OK? And I'm going to link that in just one moment to something else with our functions. Before I do that, though, why don't we play with a couple of examples? Or a couple more examples, I should say. OK. Mm -hmm. All righty. I have three more examples that I'm going to work through. And then what I'm going to do is link it, this uh, positive and negative average rate of change with increasing and decreasing functions. All right. So the first example I'm going to do now is let's pretend we have this function, and what this does is it gives the population in a town, and we'll pretend that the population is given in thousands of people, after t years. Okay? And let us do this. Here we go. So here's 10, 20, and then 30. And I'm going to make my numbers nicer than this graph shows. 10, and we'll just do 20 right there. OK. So what this is saying is after 10 years, the population of our town is at 10,000 people. After 20 years, the population of our town is about at 19,000 people. And let's have it actually grow a little more than that. And say at 30 years, the population of our town is about at 22. We could write these as ordered pairs if we feel like it. So let's say 2019, and then this would be 30. 22. Okay? Well, what if I wanted us to do the following? Okay, we'll do a few little examples here. What if I wanted us to find the average rate of change over the first 10 years? The first 10 years. Well, the first 10 years would be from 0 to 10. Okay? So 
if I'm wanting to go from zero to 10, that's the change in my time. Now I have to take the change in my function values. So let's estimate this, let's just call it five. Okay, well, my function value at 10 is 10. My function value at zero is five. So you get five over 10 or one half. Well, what does one half mean? That means over the first 10 years, the average rate of change of the population of this town is a half a thousand of people. In other words, it's gonna increase on average by 500 people per year. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do, just one more question pertaining to this lovely little graph, is I would like to know, does the average rate of change of my population, or does the change in my population grow more from 10 to 20 years, or between 20 and 30 years? Okay, well, I likened our average rate of change to the slope. So what I'm going to do is essentially just draw a line connecting those points, okay? Again, we're looking at how fast our population grows over the same period of time. This is a 10-year period and this is a 10-year period. And I claim that it's a lot more steep of a line here between 10 and 20 years versus from 20 to 30 years. Now, we could actually compute this formally, right? Because between 20 and 30 years, we get 22 minus 19 over 30 minus 20. So that's three over 10. Whereas here, we would have 19 minus 10 over 20 minus 10, so 9 tenths. Clearly, this is growing faster. Okay, so another example. Let us do this one. Just so that we're comfortable playing with the formula a little bit. What if I want us to find the average rate of change of this function between 1, 4 and 2, 13? Now I'm going to get funky on us in a second, but it's okay. Now, you might ask, where did we get these ordered pairs? Look, if we plug one into our function, well, one squared is one times three is three, plus one is four. If I plug two into my function, well, you'd square it to get four, four times three is 12, plus one is 13, okay? So, if we wanted to find our average rate of change between these two guys, what we would do is we would literally take the change in our function values over the change in our x values, celebrate the fact that we get a nice number, we get nine over one, which is nine. All right? Okay, I believe that is good for these examples. I would just like to make one more quick comment here. I'm going to draw just a rough sketch of a graph. All right, so suppose this is my point A, this is my point B. And how about this is C and this is D. Okay. 
So, what I would like to talk about is increasing and decreasing functions. This is an idea that we're going to be playing with a fair amount, but I would like to um, just give you the intuition with a graph, okay? When you are determining whether a function is increasing or decreasing, you're looking at your function values or your y values, okay? If your function values are getting larger, your function is increasing. If your function, if your y values are getting smaller, your function is decreasing. Okay, so it's pretty intuitive. I think you'll grant me, say, from x equals a to x equals b, my function is increasing. Why? Because notice my function values are getting larger. What's happening here? Well, Again, as x is getting larger, my function values are getting smaller, and therefore my function is decreasing. So we could say as x increases, if my function values also are getting larger, then well, let me say f is increasing if, as our x values get larger, our function values get larger. Our function is decreasing if, as our x values get larger, our function values get smaller. Okay? Now, the one link that I would like to make for you guys here is as follows, okay? I just want to link this increasing, decreasing business with our average rates of change. Notice, where my function is increasing, my average rates of change are positive. And where my function is decreasing, the average rates of change are negative. Okay? Why is that? Well, again, if we're going to look at the average rate of change, say, from A to B, well, we would put B minus A in our denominator Okay, which we know is positive because b is greater than a. But then we would take our function value at b minus our function value at a. But isn't our function value at b greater than our function value at a? And then if you subtract them, that's going to be positive. Positive divided by a positive is positive. On the other hand, over here from C to D, if I wanted to find the average rates of change here, well, what would I do? I would take my function value at D minus my function value at C over D minus C. But check this out. D minus C is positive because D is greater than C. But isn't my function value at D smaller than my function value at C? And therefore, this guy minus this guy is negative. And a negative divided by a positive is negative. Isn't that cute? So, one last thing, and then we're going to call it good for this section. Let me just ask you this. Suppose g is an increasing function. What can we say about g of 3 minus g of negative 1? Well, since it's an increasing function, as our x values increase, in other words, as we go from negative 1 to 3, my function values will increase. Therefore, if this is an increasing function, this difference, which is what goes in our numerator, we know is positive. Okay? If I change this saying, yo, g is a decreasing function, 
then what we would know is that this is negative. All right, that completes section 1.2. Thanks.